To begin, let's discuss what is a glacier. A glacier quite simply is a real thick ice mass that moves slowly. Now they're going to originate in an area where your snowfall is going to be greater than the snow melt. So you have an accumulation and that's what we'll call this, a zone of accumulation where they form. Now there are two different kinds of glaciers that we'll talk about in the unit. The first one is going to be what we call a valley glacier and you can see an example of it here. You have this area here where you have more snowfall than snow melt and it's going to form this ice. That ice is going to flow down this valley and we can kind of see that we have this glacier here that's just moving down a valley in the mountains. And that's about how big they are. They're going to be as big as a valley is. In addition to valley glaciers, we also have ice sheets. And ice sheets are going to be a little bit different. They're going to be a lot larger. We can see here are two examples. We have one in Greenland and one covers all of the Antarctica down in the South Pole. What makes ice sheets different is they're going to have more than one area of accumulation, more than one area where they're going to be growing from. And they're going to form these huge sheets that are going to totally blanket the landscape and they can be a lot thicker as well. So we have valley glaciers which are going to be a little bit smaller and then we have these ice sheets which are going to be a lot larger. Now there's two processes for glaciers to move. We can have internal deformation and this is where you're actually going to have here these ice crystals moving past each other. You apply enough pressure, you apply enough stress and it's going to cause them to move. It tends to be kind of brittle and this is where you get your crevasses and things of that nature. It's where this ice is splitting and moving that way. We also have what we call basal sliding. And basal sliding is a little bit different and that's where you have all of this weight is pushing down and you get this thin small layer of water here at the bottom and it's on this water that that glacier can kind of slide over. So you can change the ice and kind of form it as a solid and squish it and cause it to break and move or we can melt it down and just kind of have it flow over this little layer of water and that's what basal sliding is. Okay, so let's take a cross section of a glacier here real quickly and discuss a couple parts. Um, up here we have the zone of accumulation and that's where it is forming from. This is where the glacier comes from. It's where you have more snowfall than melt so you're building ice all the time. You can travel down the glacier and you can see it's moving and it can move by basal sliding here on the bottom or internal deformation. And one of the results of this internal deformation is going to be these crevasses, these deep cracks that we can see here. Now at the other end from the zone of accumulation we have the zone of wastage and this is where you have more melt than you have forming so this is normally where we see the end of the glacier and at the very end of it sometimes we'll see iceberg formation by calving and that's where it'll break here you can have like a crevasse and it'll cause this portion here to break off and form an iceberg. Now glaciers are really important um, they tend to get larger during the periods of time we call an ice age and we can kind of see here our glacial coverage in the most recent ice age. So if we look from the North Pole down, we can see that a lot of North America was covered in glacier. And some of the things that this glacier did, and we'll learn about this in the next lesson, but we'll see that that caused a lot of the geology that we see in this section of the United States and also up here in Canada where this glacier was once the dominant feature. Okay, so that's it for this video. Um, as always, good luck on your lessons and quizzes, and we'll see you in the next video. Now, glaciers are nature's bulldozer, and you can kind of see that is illustrated here in our picture. And glacial erosion is caused by two different ways. We can have plucking, which is actually lifting and moving of rocks, and then we can have abrasion, which is actually using those things trapped under the ice to grind and polish the surface it goes over. So we'll see that we can move stuff away, we can take stuff, but we can also grind stuff down and polish it through abrasion. Now one of the key things that we'll notice are these striations. The striations are going to be like you see back here, these grooves carved by glaciers. And as these glaciers are moving, sometimes they'll actually carry something large enough that it'll just leave a groove through the surface, or the glacier itself will groove the surface and you can kind of see where they are and how they moved. Now if we look at a valley glacier, we can see that we had the valley here and then we have a glacier that will form and then after the glacier is retreated or melted out, we'll see that there's a lot of geologic things that are left behind. We can have horns which are going to be these really steep mountains um, like the Matterhorn over in Switzerland and you'll see pictures of that in the lesson. We can have arets which are these really sharp cliffs that are going to be kind of here. We can have cirques which are going to be these little rounded 
bowls here are these tarns, which are going to be actual rounded depressions. So we can see a bunch of different things, and we'll go through these a little bit more detail inside your lesson. Now, we have three different kinds of glacial deposits we want to go over. The first and probably biggest known is going to be the till, and this is actually the material that's going to be deposited by the glacier. So anything that is picked up and set down as it moves on, that's what it's going to be. Sometimes we can have what we call stratified drift, and that's going to be part of the till, but that's going to be laid by meltwater. So as the glacier melts, you're going to have this stuff being carried away, and it's actually going to be stratified or layered based on size. And we learned that when we were talking about river depositions. And then finally, we have what we call erratics. And erratics are going to be these large boulders that are going to not match where they're found. Um, they can be anywhere from a small boulder size to larger than a house that are picked up by a glacier and traveled thousands of kilometers and deposited in the middle of fields and things where they don't match the surrounding rock around them. When we're talking about these landscapes formed by glaciers, one of the big things we're going to focus on are these moraines. And the moraines are just going to be these accumulations of till, and we can see different kinds of moraines. Lateral would be on the end or the sides of the glacier. Terminal is going to be at the end, and then we can have recessional, and that's going to be where it's backing up. So as the glacier is getting smaller, if it's been there for a period of time, it's going to leave some terminal moraine, and we can kind of see these different layers, and that'll give us a clue as to how big the glacier was. Some of the other things we hear a lot about are these kettle lakes. And the kettle lakes, or as the glacier is retreating, it's going to leave behind these chunks of dead ice. These chunks of dead ice are going to be buried down as they're going to create these depressions. And as they melt, they're going to form these kettle holes, which will then fill in with water. And we call them kettle lakes. And these are really popular up in Minnesota area. So here we can see a retreating glacier. And you can see it here. Retreating means it's going to be shrinking down this way. And we can see some of the things that are left behind. You can see that it's going to leave this ground moraine, this nice rich deposits and things that are coming this way. We'll have the terminal end moraine, which shows us how far it was, the furthest point that it got to. We'll have recessional end moraines. With, those will be periods where it stops and deposits more. Um, we also have these little drumlins here and eskers, which are going to be like these longer grooves here that are going to be carved out. And also we talked a little bit about kettle lakes. So as you go through the lesson, you'll learn a little bit more about glacial landscapes and what it's doing. But just remember, it's just from this force of being able to drag stuff across the surface of the planet. And that's what these glaciers do. Okay, so that's it for our video. As always, good luck on the lessons and we'll see you in the next video. Deserts are defined by their noticeable lack of water. So we don't see water all the time. We're not gonna see a lot of rainfall throughout the year but we still have some of the same processes we see in more temperate regions or in more tropical regions in areas where you're going to have a lot more water and precipitation. Um, we're still going to have weathering occur, but in deserts it tends to be more mechanical. We're not going to have as much chemical weathering because of the limitation in the amount of water that we have. However, there is going to be some, but the majority of it is going to be mechanical weathering. And then we also see the rise of ephemeral streams. And ephemeral streams occur only after we get the rains. So here we live in the basin and range area in the Great Basin. And you notice that we have some streams and we call our streams a little bit differently. Most of our streams are washes. And what they are is they're ephemeral, which means that when we get the heavy rains, then they start to flow. And when these rains subside, the water will evaporate away and we no longer have the streams. Now the desert landscape is going to be a little bit different as well. We have the canyons and things that you can see back in here. And when it rains, those canyons are becoming ephemeral streams. And they're going to carry with them debris and the results of all the weathering that we see happening. And what we'll notice is a buildup of an alluvial fan. So if you find the mouth of a canyon, what you're going to see is this alluvial fan here, this buildup of debris. And you can see there's two of them here in our picture. And that's going to be all the sediment that it's carved out of that canyon as the waters flowed through or carried out of that canyon as the waters flowed through. We'll see dunes and we'll talk about those a little bit more in the next lesson. But we also see these playa lakes. And these playa lakes, you can see one is right over here. These are going to be lakes that will form when we have the rains. And then after the rains stop, we have lakes last for a little while until the water evaporates away. So these are our primary landscapes we're going to see in the desert. 
that's it for this video. Good luck on the lesson, and we'll see you in the next video. So wind can also act as an agent of erosion, and it does so through two different processes. The first is going to be deflation, and deflation is going to where it's lifting and removing loose particles. So as we can see down here in the pictures, we have an awful lot of these loose particles here, and as the wind blows, it's going to pick up these smaller ones, and it's going to carry them away. And that's what we call deflation. And as we do so, the finally what's going to happen is we're going to end up with a lot of these larger particles that are going to form kind of like a crust. And we call that desert pavement. So if you leave the desert pavement, it protects what's below. And that's how we can get some desert soils to form. But if you were to break it, then what happens is we have more deflation occur. and We take away more of these other particles that we have. Now, the other type of erosion we can have is what we call abrasion. And abrasion is where we have that wind-blown sand, and it's going to basically sandblast. It's going to cut and polish through other things. So if you've ever walked on the beach and the wind's blowing, you could feel that sand whip across your legs, and that's what we're talking about is that abrasion. Okay, so there's two primary kinds of wind deposits. The first is loess over here, and that's going to be a silt that's going to blanket an entire landscape. And we can see that here we have these thick layers of silt that have built up and this we can see in the Midwest and that's what caused the formation of such fertile soil that we have in the breadbasket of America. We also have dunes which are going to be mounds or ridges on the sand and we can see some pictures of those here and in the next slide we'll discuss the different types of sand dunes. Okay our final slide today I just wanted to show you a picture of the six different types of dunes that they'll be covering in the lesson. We have the Barkin dune here, which we kind of see our isolation, little single dunes here. They're formed when something will stop, block the wind like vegetation, and you get sand built up there. We have transverse dunes, which form these ridges that are perpendicular to the direction of wind. We have Barkinoid dunes, which is when you have these Barkins and they start to line up with each other, and you start to see them blend together, and you get these wavy-looking dunes. And then we have longitudinal, where we'll have wind and multiple directions that'll form like a ridge of sand and it kind of forms in the same direction the overall direction the wind is blowing when we have winds blowing in multiple directions we can end up with these star dunes and then finally we have our parabolic dunes so in the lesson they'll go through these in a little more detail and that ends our video so as always good luck on your quiz and we'll see you in the next video